Hello everyone! If you are a new viewer or an old subscriber, I am just happy to have you here. Today's video is definitely going to be a longer one, so just bear with me. I had the idea of starting a series on this channel where I talk about all the serial killers from each state, and today I'm going to be talking about Alabama. I'm going to try not to ramble for too long, but there are a couple of things that I do want to go over before I get into the actual video. Today I'm going to be discussing heavier topics such as SA, death, and abuse, so if you're uncomfortable with that, I would definitely recommend you to skip this one and I will hopefully see you in another. If anyone or you personally are dealing with any of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, I would definitely recommend you to look at the hotline number I'm going to have in my description as well. Also, I am not idolizing these men or women at all. I think they are the scum of the earth and are exactly where they belong, so I will not tolerate any comments of people swooning over these guys or girls. Keep that to yourself and get help please. If I miss anything or mess anything up, feel free to let me know in the comments so I can fix it as soon as possible. Now with those disclaimers, let's get into the video. Starting with Donald Broadnax. Born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1961, he was just 16 years old when he committed his first crime. When he and his friend Gregory Manson got into a heated argument and Broadnax pulled out a gun and shot him. This wasn't just, oh, he shot him and that's that. He emptied an entire clip, then proceeded to reload and fire three more shots into Manson's dead body before fleeing the crime scene. He was arrested three months later and was sentenced to 99 years in prison. In 1986, he was granted parole, however, was sent back to prison due to violating his stipulations by staying at a house owned by a notorious drug dealer named Raymond Godfather Mims. The house was raided and they found multiple guns, which was also against his parole. In 1992, he joined a work release program and became a painter for Wellborn Forest Products. He was described as mild-mannered and nice, and even went on to marry in 1994 to Hector Jan Stamps, a woman who frequently visited him when he was in prison. A few short months later, Broadnax was granted temporary release to work at a factory. He was able to convince his supervisor to let him stay later for some reason, and his wife ended up visiting him while he was at work with her four-year-old grandson. Broadnax brutally beat his wife to death with a plank of wood and hit her body in his car. He then drove to a secluded area with her grandson and beat him to death as well. He drove the car to an abandoned house and left it sitting there. He was later caught by fellow inmates when he was trying to hide his bloodstained clothing and was charged with two counts of capital murder. He was found guilty on all counts by the jury, who then recommended the death penalty, and when they did that, Broadnack's family, and him included, started to cry, but it's like, how are you gonna go and murder people and then be surprised that you get in trouble for it? I just feel bad for the families that'll never get to see their loved ones again. In September of the same year he received the official death sentence, and as for today, he is sitting in Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore, Alabama, awaiting execution. Our next one is Joseph Paul Franklin. James Clayton Vaughn Jr. was born in Mobile, Alabama on April 13th, 1950. He was the eldest son of James Vaughn Sr. and Helen Vaughn and had three siblings. Vaughn's father was a World War II veteran and a butcher, however, left the family when he was eight years old. According to Joseph's sister, their father was mentally and physically abused to them when he did visit, and their mother actually had him arrested multiple times for public drunkenness. Vaughn's mother wasn't much better, though. She was known for her strict and perfectionist nature, and although she said she never physically harmed her children, it was believed that she may have also been abusive. From later statements where Vaughn would talk about how he was rarely given enough food and endured intense physical abuse during his childhood. He expressed that his mother had no concern about him or his siblings, and according to him, these circumstances hindered his emotional growth, resulting in him being at least 10 years behind other people in terms of maturity. Throughout high school, he was drawn to evangelical Christianity and later became fascinated with Nazis, so it wasn't a surprise when he ended up joining the National Socialist White People's Party and the Ku Klux Klan. He changed his name to Joseph Paul Franklin as tribute to Paul Joseph Goebbels and Benjamin Franklin's. In the 1960s, Franklin's encounter with Adolf's Hitler Mein Kampf sparked a desire in him to start a race war. He said that no other book has affected me as strongly as Mein Kampf, there was something peculiar about it. He decided to drop out of high school after suffering a severe eye injury and would get married soon after. He turned into an abusive spouse and accumulated a series of minor legal infractions. His involvement in the white supremacist organizations deepened. He grew increasingly confrontational towards minority groups. By the mid-1970s, he had distanced himself from even the most extreme hate groups, and not because he thought what he was doing was wrong, but rather because he was tired of sitting around and believed that they did not express their hatred enough through violence. He later claimed that his self 
self-imposed mission was to motivate his fellow supremacists into action. Franklin began living as a nomad, targeting and attacking people he considered inferior, especially those of black and Jewish descent. He relied on bank robberies for money and also made income by selling his blood to blood banks. In the end, this would aid the FBI in his capture. Okay, I know that this may sound stupid to some people, but hear me out. He could have potentially saved someone's life, and wouldn't it be ironic if that person was Jewish or a person of color? I know that may sound goofy, but it just kind of made me laugh to think about. The summer of 1976 marked a significant turning point. During Labor Day weekend in Atlanta, Franklin targeted an interracial couple and sprayed them with mace. This incident marked his first documented physical assault, and it only escalated from there because Joseph began a racist-fueled killing spree spanning from the mid-1970s to the early 1980s. On July 29th, 1977, he carried out a bombing in a synagogue in Tennessee. Just a few days later in Wisconsin, he encountered two men in a parking lot and fatally shot them. It's believed that he potentially could have killed more than 20 people during this time, but there's just not enough conclusive evidence. On August 20th, 1980, Franklin killed Ted Fields and David Martin near Liberty Park in Salt Lake, Utah. After the Utah homicides, Franklin returned to the Midwest. In Kentucky, he was questioned about a firearm that was found in his car, but managed to escape. However, evidence from his vehicle linked him to the sniper murders. Investigators issued a nationwide alert to blood banks, notifying them of his racist tattoos and how he would often visit them to make money. And it was only a couple weeks until an employee in Florida spotted him and contacted the FBI. He was arrested in Lakeland on October 28th. During the 1997 Missouri trial, Franklin made an unsuccessful attempt to flee while facing charges for the murders of Gerald Gordon. Psychiatrist Dorothy Lewis, who interviewed Franklin extensively, provided testimony in his defense, stating that she believed he suffered from a paranoid schizophrenia and was mentally unfit to participate in the trial. Lewis also highlighted his delusional thoughts and traumatic childhood Mark could have had a play in his outburst. He was held on death row at a correctional facility near Mineral Point, Missouri, and would be executed by lethal injection on November 20th, 2013. Raymond Eugene Brown. On the evening of October 1st, 1960, at only 14 years old, Brown broke into the home where his 31-year-old aunt, Berta Martin, 63-year-old grandmother, Ethel Ogle, and 82-year-old disabled great-grandmother, Evelina Ogle, lived. He intended to break in to steal money for cleats, but while searching the house, he encountered his aunt, who had awakened because of the noise. Upon being discovered, Brown violently attacked his aunt, repeatedly stabbing her with a kitchen knife, a total of 100 and 23 times. And to get rid of any possible witnesses, he proceeded to stab his great-grandmother and grandmother. He engaged in post-mortem actions. They were discovered by Brown's mother. During the investigation of the crime scene, the officers found several bloody heel marks that they believe belonged to a teenager. To find out if he was the one responsible, they questioned many of his classmates, friends, and family. Some of them mentioned to the police how he had planned to visit his aunt's house and how he had supposedly visited after soccer practice. He was apprehended ended five days later and confessed to the crimes, with his fingerprints matching the ones at the house. Something else that I found while I was reading about this is that there were a bunch of people that would visit the house from like surrounding counties and states. How there were over like 600 cars on the block that they lived trying to sneak in and grab stuff. They actually assigned their neighbor, who was a 67 year old man that could not handle the amount of people that were there pushing and shoving him, so they ended up getting a cop to finally get out there and guard the house. So instead of receiving the death sentence, he was sentenced to three life terms without the possibility of parole and transferred to a nearby prison. Throughout the sentencing phase, it was noted that he showed no signs of visible emotions. While serving his sentence, Brown decided to start studying auto mechanics and actively participated in various prisoner rehabilitation programs. He earned the reputation of a model prisoner and because of his good behavior, he was granted parole in 1973. He moved back to Ashland and stayed with his mother. Like I'd, I'd imagine that it was very uncomfortable. But either way, he didn't stay there long and moved to Montgomery where he began working at an auto shop. He made enough money to rent an apartment. However, this good behavior did not last long because in the late 1970s, he began to develop a severe alcohol addiction and while intoxicated, he would SA women. In the 1980s, he essayed his apartment manager and even attempted to strangle her, knocking her unconscious. And when he thought that she had passed away, he ran off. He was later caught when the woman called the police. 
Violating his parole, he was sent back to prison for only six years until he was granted parole again. After his release, he found another job at a different auto shop in Montgomery. In 1986, Brown met Linda Lamonte, a 31-year-old single mother of two children. They became close, and in 1987, Brown moved in with her. During this time, it was said that he completely stopped all aggressive behavior and was respected by friends and family. However, his behavior took a turn for the worse, and on the night of August 9, 1987, Raymond did the worst thing a human could do to his wife and his wife's 10-year-old daughter. I'm not going to go into specific details, but you can guess what happened. He left her six-year-old son unharmed, though, and when he was finished doing what he did to his wife and her daughter, he took a picture of Linda's corpse, taped it to the TV, and then scattered a deck of playing cards around their bodies, and on a piece of paper he listed the victims' names and wrote me, and then put the paper next to their bodies. Lamonte's absence from work and her children's absence from school led her parents to visit her house where they found the bodies and her son. After the police investigation, David Lamont, her ex-husband, revealed that Brown was at the house when he dropped Aaron off. Based on David's testimony and incriminating evidence, Brown was added to the wanted list. After the arrest warrant was put out, police discovered that Brown had been in a car accident in Wallsboro, Elmore County before the bodies were found. He showed his driver's license to the traffic police and explained the situation, declined medical help and left the scene. He then grabbed groceries and a fishing rod from the car and went towards a nearby lake. On August 12th, law enforcement agencies conducted a search in a wooded area near Jordan Lake. The area had been evacuated due to visitors and Brown was caught later that day when he came out of the woods and went to a local convenience store to get cigarettes and a drink. The clerk and employees noticed his messy appearance and called law enforcement where he was arrested. Brown cooperated with the arrest and traces of blood matching Lamontes were found on his clothing and car after forensic examination. Brown pleaded not guilty to the murders, claiming amnesia but a psychiatric evaluation found him mentally stable, but they did find that he may suffer from a personality disorder. Despite this, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was transferred to death row at the Holman Correctional Facility, and over the next few years, Brown and his legal team made multiple appeals to delay the execution and reverse the sentence. In 1990, he appealed based on procedural errors in his trial. Initially, his appeal was approved, but the prosecutor's cross-appeal led to the Supreme Court affirming the death penalty. Later, the court reinstated its decision and referred the case for further scrutiny. In the late 1990s, Brown's legal team appealed Appealed, alleging denial of his right to participate in jury selection and other discrepancies, such as a juror providing false information. However, the court rejected these arguments, citing the lack of evidence and their insignificance to Brown's trial. Subsequent appeals, including claims of inadequate legal representation and that the death penalty was considered cruel and an unusual punishment, were also dismissed. Brown died on death row in 2008. Something I do want to state here, too, is that it was said Raymond had a normal upbringing and a happy childhood. He was a regular churchgoer and showed no signs for concern. He even played football for his high school team and was well liked by his peers. So it's so bizarre for someone that showed no signs of any kind of hostility to just one day snap. All right, our first woman, Nanny Doss. Nanny was born on November 4th, 1905 in Blue Mountain, Alabama. Her parents were Louisa and James Hazel. She had one brother and three sisters. Unfortunately, James was controlling and abusive and made his children work on the farm instead of focus on their extracurricular activities such as school, which affected Nanny's academic success. Nanny had a traumatic incident at nine when her family was traveling by train. She hit her head on a metal bar due to a sudden stop, causing long-lasting health issues such as headaches, blackouts, and depression. During her youth, she would often read her mother's romance magazines as a form of escapism. However, Nanny's father imposed strict rules on Hazel and her sisters, forbidding them from attending any dances or dressing feminine, fear fearing that they would attract unwanted attention from men. At 16, though, she ended up marrying her co-worker, Charlie Braggs, after only dating for four months. Surprisingly, her father approved of the relationship. Braggs lived with his mother 
mother, even though Nanny and him were married. And Nanny was not very happy about this, even writing later, I had married as my father wished in 1921 to a boy I had only known for four or five months, who had no family, only a mother who was unwed and who had taken over my life completely. She had never seen anything wrong with what she had done, and she would not let my own mother stay. With Bragg's mother demanding all of his attention, it restricted their love life and led to a failing marriage. They did have four daughters together though from 1923 to 1927. Annie developed a severe smoking addiction and turned to drinking. Both partners, unhappy with each other, ended up with both of them seeing other people on the side, and Bragg's would spend most of his nights elsewhere. In 1927, the couple experienced the tragic loss of their two middle daughters due to food poisoning when Braggs came home and saw them laying on the kitchen floor. Shortly after, Braggs decided to take their firstborn daughter, Melvina, and run away, leaving behind their newborn. Not long after, Braggs' mother passed away and Nanny had to find work in a cotton mill to provide for herself and Florine. Braggs eventually returned with Melvina in the summer of 1928, accompanied by a divorced woman who had a child of her own. Braggs and Nanny eventually divorced and took her two daughters back to her mother's house. Braggs always claimed that he left Nanny out of fear, noting that death followed wherever she went. Only a year later, Nanny married Robert Franklin Harrelson and they lived in Jacksonville with Melvina and Florine. However, after a short period of time, she uncovered his alcoholism and criminal past involving assault. Surprisingly, their marriage lasted for another 16 years, and in 1945, Harrelson essayed Nanny. The next day, she put rat poison in his whiskey, and he died that evening. And it was also around this time that Nanny's daughter, Melvina, actually had two children of her own. However, one would pass away soon after birth due to unknown circumstances. Melvina had stated that when her mother was visiting, she thought she saw Nanny stick a hat pin into the baby's head. When she asked her husband and sister for clarification, they said Nanny had told them that the baby was dead, and they also noticed that she she was holding a hat pin as well. The doctors could not give a positive explanation and it was left unknown. Melvina and her husband's relationship unfortunately ended, but she was able to move on and started dating a soldier. Nanny disapproved of him and during a visit to her father's house after a fight with her mother, Melvina's son Robert died mysteriously under Nanny's care on July 7th, 1945. The cause of death was determined to be unknown asphyxia. Two months later, Nanny received a $500 life insurance payout she had taken out on Robert. It didn't take long for Nanny to meet her third husband, Arlie Lanning, through a Lonely Hearts column while she was traveling through Lexington, North Carolina. They married just three days after meeting. Lanning, like Harrelson, struggled with alcoholism and was good with the ladies, if you know what I mean. But Nanny didn't seem to care, though, because this time around, it was her that would often disappear for months at a time. But when she was around, people would see her as a loving and doting wife. And when Lanning died of supposed heart failure, the townspeople supported Nanny and all of them showed up to his funeral. The home that Nanny and Lanning lived in was left to Lanning's sister in his will. However, it wasn't long before tragedy struck, again, because the home caught on fire. But luckily for Nanny, she was the one that received the insurance payout, and not Lanning's sister. Nanny packed up and decided to move in with her sister, Dovey, who happened to be bedridden. And who would have guessed it that not long after her arrival, Dovey passed away. As usual, Nanny quickly recovered from loss of her ex-husband and was looking for husband number four. Instead of going to the Lonely Hearts column, she joined a dating service called the Diamond Circle Club and soon met Richard Morton, a man from Jamestown, North Carolina. Richard may not have been a drunk, but he would often cheat on Nanny. So Nanny, on a murderous hot streak, decided, hey, why not take out two birds with one stone? And in 1953, she poisoned not only Morton, but her mom as well. Only three months after Morton's death, she married Samuel Doss, a minister from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Samuel was hospitalized in September for flu-like symptoms. Doctors identified a severe infection in his digestive tract and he was discharged on October 5th, but sadly passed away on October 12th, 1954. And on the night that she went to collect his insurance policy, she was arrested. Nanny Doss admitted to murdering multiple family members and four of her husbands, but she was only prosecuted for one case. She pled guilty and received a life sentence. The state didn't pursue the death penalty because she was a woman. She passed away in 1965 from leukemia in prison. Thomas Warren Wisenham was born on January 29, 1947 in Pritchard, Alabama. He was the youngest of four children and grew up in a low-income family, and his mother was described as a violent and argumentative woman 
and she was married to an alcoholic. She would attack her husband physically. She encouraged her children to engage in similar behavior. And this is not funny, but it made me chuckle the first time I read it. Her husband would get drunk on moonshine and then try to seduce her, but it said that she would always decline, which I, I know it's not funny, but it just kind of made me laugh. His mother directed her abuse solely towards her husband while spoiling Wisenhan and being overly protective of him. Until the age of seven, he shared a bed with her and until the age of 16, they shared a bedroom. His sister noted that it seemed this relationship was a big cause for his moodiness and violent tendencies. Even as a teenager, he was always accompanied by his mother and she never allowed him out of her sight. A psychologist suggested that Wisenhant harbored resentment towards his mother. It was in 1963 when Thomas committed his first crime, which was robbing a blind woman. But the judge threw the case out due to a technicality. It was only a couple months later that he was an immediate suspect in the murder of a 72-year-old woman. The police questioned Wisenhant regarding the murder, however, his family provided him with an alibi, stating that he was at home at the time of the shooting. A witness later mentioned that before the shooting, Thomas and his friends were playing with a stolen handgun and he had taken a bullet from the revolver, held it above his head and said that he would soon kill somebody with it. The police later disclosed that the victim had a discussion with Wisenhant about his poor behavior, which led many to believe that this was why he had killed her. However, for unknown reasons, Wisenhant was never brought to trial. After the shooting incident, Wisenhant joined the U.S. Air Force and was stationed at an Air Force base near Colorado Springs. On October 25th, 1965, he assaulted Rose Covington, causing severe injuries, Covington testified that she didn't know him, and shoe prints matched Wisenhant's. He was found guilty of assault with intent to commit murder, received a 20-year prison sentence, and dishonorable discharge. He served a sentence at Fort Carson and was later transferred to an undisclosed federal prison. In 1970, his sentence was reduced to 10 years, and he was granted parole on November 28th in 1973. On November 21st, 1975, Wisenhant assaulted Patricia Hitt, a 28-year-old mother of two who worked at a convenience store in Mobile County, Alabama. He approached her, attacked her, and ultimately shot her in the head, causing her death. At first, two other men were taken into custody for the crime. However, on April 16th, 1976, Wisenhant abducted and killed another who worked at a different convenience store named Venora Hyatt, who was 44 years old. Took her to an abandoned house. There, he murdered her and left her body. The next day, he returned to the scene and did more things to her body. He also took her wristwatch and gifted it to his wife. On October 16th, 1976, he abducted Cheryl Lynn Payton, a 23-year-old convenience store clerk. He essayed her in his pickup truck before fatally shooting her in the head with a 32 caliber pistol. He then disposed of her body in a nearby woods and fled. On October 17th, he returned back to the scene and did more things to her body. He removed a big chunk of her area and then cut her stomach. He was noticed leaving the crime scene and the police caught him after a short pursuit. While being questioned, he openly admitted to all of his crimes. Not only did he confess to killing Peyton, but he also accepted the responsibility for murdering Pitt and Hyatt. Later on, he confessed to killing Haynes when he was a teenager and also admitted to attacking Covington and two other women, including his wife. He also said that the only victim he essayed was Peyton. And because of the high profile of the case, the trial was moved to Birmingham. It began on August 1st, 1977. He pleaded guilty by reason of insanity. However, on August 9th, the jury found him guilty of capital murder. He was sentenced to death on September 7th, and he was executed on May 27th, 2010 in Alabama after spending a record-breaking 32 years in prison. Cleafus Prince Jr. was born in Birmingham, Alabama on July 24th, 1967. Being the oldest of eight growing up, it was said that Prince was an all-around typical kid who showed no signs of aggression, with many stating he was pleasant to be with, enjoyed sports, and was polite to everybody he was around. And even though he grew up in the rougher side of Birmingham, he stayed away from trouble and wasn't affiliated with any gangs. He even graduated from from high school and enlisted in the Navy. However, things started to get rocky shortly after. He was caught stealing a money order from the post office, convicted of larceny, and was sentenced to almost a month in the brig, fined $466, and ultimately discharged in October 1989. He moved into the Buena Vista Gardens apartment complex, and it was downhill after this. 
Within a span of just five months, he managed to essay and murder four women who all lived in the same or in relative distance from his apartment complex. From May to September, it seemed as if Prince took a break until unfortunately started back up again and took the lives of two more unsuspecting women. At the time of the murders, police called the serial killer a disorganized opportunist because of the reoccurring patterns in his crimes. Prince would enter his female victims' homes during the day through unlocked doors or windows and waiting until they got home and catching them off guard while they were showering or sleeping. Usually the same weapon was used, which was a kitchen knife, and it wasn't until February of 1991 that Prince got caught while attempting to break into a house in Scripps Ranch. He had been following a woman home, and just as she was about to shower, she heard him coming through the front door. Frightened, she quickly ran out of the house to a neighbor's. The neighbor confronted Prince, who claimed he was searching for a female friend who had supposedly entered the house. Eventually, Prince gave up and left the area. The eyewitness managed to write down his plates and identified him from photographs. On February 4th, 1991, he was arrested in the parking lot of a health club after the police had alerted the staff to be on lookout. Following his arrest, Prince agreed to provide blood and saliva samples. These samples connected him to the string of murders that he had committed over the year, but his parents were adamant that the police had made a mistake because they firmly believed that their son was innocent and incapable of committing these crimes and convinced that he was being set up. Interestingly, the police even believed that there may have been a mistake because he had showed no signs of nervousness or anxiety during the lengthy interrogation. Following a thorough examination of the physical evidence, the judge proceeded with Prince's trial. Despite the defense's unsuccessful argument claiming lack of evidence, Prince was ultimately found guilty on July 15th of 1995. For all six counts of first-degree murder and 21 additional felony charges. After further deliberation, the jury reached the verdict of the death penalty. Prince is currently on death row at San Quentin Prison. He tried to appeal his sentence, arguing that the media's extensive coverage had influenced the jury. However, his appeal was rejected by the Supreme Court of California in 2007. Roger Dale Stafford, born on November 4, 1951, in Sheffield, Alabama, there's not much said about his upbringing or childhood, but there are conflicting theories as to how he was treated as some say his household was typical and others say that Roger was abused but there's not anything concrete. It's believed that Roger was enlisted in the army after high school and served in the Vietnam War. Roger married Verna Stafford and they would go on to commit multiple counts of murder together. Stafford's killing spree started on January 12, 1974, when he took the life of Jimmy Earl Berry, a 20-year-old student at the University of North Alabama. Berry was working as a manager at a McDonald's. He was tragically shot four times, and the perpetrator made off with $1,399. The crime remained a mystery for four years until Stafford and his brother Harold were implicated by Verna. Sadly, Stafford was never brought to trial for Berry's murder due to his prior convictions in Oklahoma. On June 22, 1978, he carried on his killing spree alongside his wife, Verna, and his brother, Harold, while driving on Interstate 35. His wife signaled the Lorenz family for assistance. Melvin Lorenz, 38, his wife, Linda, 31, and their son, Richard, 12, were on their way to North Dakota for Melvin's mother's funeral. As soon as the Lorenz family was pulled over to the side, Stafford seized the opportunity to rob and brutally kill them. As a mother and a father themselves, because they had three children, it's sick me to think that they could look at this innocent family and kill not only the two parents but their son. I don't know it just kind of bothers me. I mean it all bothers me but that specifically like as parents and together as a couple it's just like you take it takes a special kind of sick to do that. Three weeks passed and they committed a robbery at the Sirloin Stockade restaurant in Oklahoma City, resulting in the tragic death of six employees. Six days after the robbery, Harold Stafford passed away in a motorcycle accident in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this is where their whole operation started to crumble because it was here that police managed to track down a woman who visited his body at a local funeral home in Chicago. They arrested Verna there and soon after apprehended Roger as well. On October 17th, 1979, Roger was found guilty on all nine murders and received the death sentence. Verna, his wife, testified against him and later divorced him while he was on death row. She was sentenced to two life terms for her involvement in the crimes. Stafford got married two more times while awaiting his execution, which is so weird that anyone could look at the serial killer and be like, oh yeah, I'd like to bring him home. Stafford was put to death in Oklahoma through lethal injection on July 1st, 1995. Shortly after, Sandy Howard, an assistant attorney general, received a $5 gift certificate from the Sirloin Stockade. The certificate had a message written on the back saying, hey, you got away with it. I am a murderer and you helped me do it. 
I am innocent and you know it. It was signed by Roger Dale Stafford with his inmate number. Investigators discovered that the certificate was sent from the Sirloin restaurant in El Reno, Oklahoma, and was mailed on July 3rd, two days after Stafford's execution. So that brings us to the end of the video, and I want to say thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I know it's a lot, and it's probably going to be my longest video on here. And if I missed anybody, leave it in the comments below, and I'll get to them in another video. I hope you have an amazing day, and if no one's told you this in a while, let me be the one to say that you are doing amazing. Try to keep a positive outlook on things and surround yourself with people who make you feel good and truly care about you. You deserve to be happy. Try not to bring others down. Sometimes I don't feel like enough people hear that and uh, I want to put some kind of positivity into this video because it's just kind of negative. So I will see you in the next video. Hope you have a great day and bye!